Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Thank you for joining us on Facebook. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. We're going to sing about that wonderful name, that beautiful name, that powerful name, the name of Jesus. with God the Lord most high your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you our Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a beautiful Father, we come to you now in that beautiful name, in that wonderful name, in that powerful name of Jesus. And we praise you, Lord, that you've reminded us through this song that nothing can stand against the name of Jesus. Father, we admit to you that as we look around in the world today, we, we wonder. But we know the truth. Nothing, nothing can stand against that name. And so this morning, your children have gathered here and we cry out the name Jesus. Jesus. Help us to worship you in spirit and truth. Help us to be an encouragement to one another. And then as your word is preached, help us to hear your voice. Prepare us, Lord, for the week to come. Help us to be your servants. Thank you for the opportunity to gather, those of us who are in the room, those who have joined by way of Facebook. We join our lives, our hearts, 
our voices together and we worship you and you alone. We ask you, Lord, to be with those who are hurting this morning. We ask you to be comfort and strength. We ask you to be encouragement and healing. Thank you for the time we share together, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you again for being here. It's good to see each of you and uh, those who are on Facebook. We appreciate you joining us that way as well. And we're going to welcome one another. We haven't even had a chance to stand up yet. I was letting you rest a little bit because we're going to get after it in a minute. What I want you to do, though, when the music starts, if you'll turn around and look at that camera back there and say hello or I love you or welcome or wave to those on Facebook and then greet one another. So would you stand and let's do that. be seated but keep that smile on your face if you don't mind and listen to the words to this great old hymn how sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear it soothes our sorrows heals our wounds and drives away our fear it makes the wounded spirit whole and calms the troubled breast. Tis manna to the hungry soul and to the weary rest. Dear name, the rock on which I build my shield and hiding place, my never failing treasure filled with boundless stores of grace. Jesus my shepherd, brother, friend, my prophet, priest, and king, my Lord, my life, my way, my end, accept the praise I bring. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be. 
children, let's sing that last verse. He breaks the power of cancel sin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His blood can make the foulest flee. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Strong and mighty tower, 
Go ahead and pick up your Bibles, and I want to go ahead and apologize to you in advance. I know the, uh, the bulletin says Philippians 1, 1 through 11, and that is indeed our text this morning. But we're also going to be connecting that to a passage in Acts, Acts chapter 16, verses 11 through 34. And we're going to be spending a majority of our time in that particular passage. So I'd like for you to go ahead and turn to Acts, and we'll start out by reading that passage this morning. And read Philippians as we get into the sermon. It's Acts chapter 16, verses 11 through 34. Acts 16, starting in verse 11, says, Setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, Come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Verse 16, it says, As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they brought them to to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in on attacking them. The magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Then the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, we're all here. And the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and Trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. He was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Please pray with me. Jesus, we see here a salvation story, three very different people. We praise you that you desire for all men to come to a saving knowledge, for all to put their trust in you. It's not just for a few. It's not just for some. This is for all. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll speak through your word here in a few short minutes. Jesus, I pray that your name will be glorified. Lord, that as we continue to study how to function and and act as the church, Lord, we'll open our arms to all in this community, that we would glorify you. 
Jesus, we love you, and we thank you so much for who you are. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is the season of thanksgiving, and we have so many things to be thankful for, but this scripture says, in everything, give thanks. There are some things that it's a little more difficult to give thanks for than others. This song is for someone this morning. It's your testimony or it's words that will encourage. Please listen to the words and give thanks in all things. trials that come my way in that way I can grow each day as I let you lead and thank you Lord for the patience those trials bring in that process of growing But it goes against the way I am to put my human nature down and let the spirit take control of all I do. Cause when those trials come, my human nature shouts the thing to do, and God's soft prompting can be easily ignored. I thank you, Lord. With each trial, I feel inside that you're there to help lead and guide me away from wrong cause you promised Lord that with every testing that your way of escaping is easier to bear but it goes against the way I am to put my human nature down and let the spirit take control of all I do. Cause when those trials come, my human nature shouts the thing to do. And God's soft prompting can be That growing brings in surrender of everything. Life is so worthwhile. And I thank you, Lord, that when everything's put in place, out in front I can see your face. And it's there you belong.
Everybody hear me? It's on? Got to check and make sure because sometimes I don't have this earpiece on correctly. You can go ahead and turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. This is where we're going to get started this morning. If you think about it long and hard enough, the gathering of the church on a Sunday morning is a marvel. The gathering of the church on a Sunday morning is a marvel. And what I mean by that is not the service. It's not the building that we gather in, but it's the people. Let's take us just right here in this sanctuary. All of us that are gathered here this morning, those of us that are joining us through our live stream, we all have different backgrounds. We all look at the world slightly different way. We have different viewpoints on, on different subjects. We have different stories. We came to know Christ in different ways. We may not understand much about each other, but with Christ as our common bond, we can do life together. How else would I hang out with Jerry Clifton? But, no, I'm just kidding, Jerry. <laughs> I'm teasing. Just pick it up. He's an easy one to pick on. But just like, if you think about it long and hard enough, the gathering of the church is a marvel. So we may not have much in common. May, maybe this world doesn't have much. It doesn't give us much we have in common. But with Christ as our common bond, we can do life together. It truly is amazing. Brother Donnie has been preaching on a series of passages on Sunday morning that have to do with the church. Our purpose, our function, how we relate to one another as church members, how we treat one another. This morning we're going to continue in that same line of thought by looking at the very beginning of Paul's letter to the Philippians and then going over to Acts 16 and examining our common bond that which we have in common. Now, may not much, we have something in common that is far greater than anything that this world has to offer. And because of that, we exist as the church. So turn over to Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Paul's letter to the Philippians is unique in the sense that it's one of the few letters where it doesn't hold direct criticism for its listeners. Now, there's a small portion at the very end where he urges two women uh, who are quarreling to get along. But for the most part, Paul's letter to the Philippians is one of joy and longing for this group of people. Think of Galatians, Ephesians, 1 and 2 Corinthians. Paul's always saying, stop doing that. Start doing this. Don't touch that. Stay away from there. When you think of 1 Corinthians, stop marrying your stepmother. Stop getting drunk during the Lord's Supper. He's always giving some sort of constructive criticism to the church. He's, he's giving instruction. But with Philippians, it's a letter of joy and affection for those who are listening, to those who received the letter. There's even a, a line in here towards the end of this passage we're going to read where he says, He yearns for them with all the affection of Christ Jesus. That affection took Christ to the cross, and he yearns for them with that kind of affection. Look at me with verse, uh, in, in Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we have a basic Pauline introduction. It says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And now listen to this, verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, 
both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory of and praise of God. Did you experience Paul's affection for this particular group of people when we read that? These are Paul's people. We use the, the term, you know, these are the people that Paul would do life with. He wants to have Sunday school with them, have Christmas parties, have the kids over to celebrate birthdays and, and, and life celebrations. These are Paul's people. I want to ask you, to just think in your heads for a moment, who are the people that come to mind that generate these kinds of feelings in you? That generate the same kind, to use the same language that Paul uses, to generate that same kind of yearning and affection and, and joyful feelings. Family, friends, church members, coworkers. Who are the people in your life that generate these same kinds of, of longings, these these joyful gatherings, or the, or the joyful thoughts of gathering. Uh, I, for, for me, I can liken it to when October comes around. We do a big family gathering in October. We do a big family gathering at Thanksgiving. And, and see, my brother, he lives in Amarillo. Jacqueline's got a sister in Central Texas, six hours away. Both sets of grandparents are seven hours away in Oklahoma. We don't have any immediate family in this area. And so when we get together... As that time approaches, Jacqueline and I experience this longing, this deep desire to get together with our family because we love one another. We enjoy each other's company. I can liken it to a group of guys from this church that go and play frisbee golf down in Lumberton, Beaumont. We go and we play and we, we, we spend time with one another and we enjoy each other's company. And I genuinely look forward to those times to spend with this group of guys and I'm joyful, I'm, I'm, I have those thoughts of joy just, just filling my heart to just to think about the next time that we get to go out and do that. I truly and genuinely enjoy the time that I spend with that group of people. Can you liken Paul's affection that he's experiencing to, to any, anything in your mind, any friends, any family, any coworkers? Surely we've all experienced that before. There's a group of youth pastors in Jasper that I get together with. We may differ on some things, but I truly and genuinely enjoy my time with them. We pray for one another. We, we uh, support each other. I truly enjoy those times that I get to spend with them. And if you'll allow me to back up from Philippians for just a second, I want to explain the nature of how a bond is successful. See, in any of those relationships I just mentioned to you with my family, with my friends here at the church, with, uh, with that group of youth pastors I get together with, that doesn't mean that we don't have disagreements. That doesn't mean that we don't have differences, that there's not quirks in that relationship. In any relationship that you guys have in your marriage, uh, in friendships, in, you know, with coworkers, with, with fellow church members, we have quirks. There's bumps in the road. There's differences. There's disagreements that we have. But a bond is successful when that which you have in common is greater than than the differences that exist. Now, I'm not talking about in number. I'm talking about in importance or in priority. When what we have in common is greater than our differences or our disagreements or those quirks that exist, then a bond can be successfully made. One of Jacqueline and I's earliest arguments and longest, uh, long-going argument, I believe it still exists today, began when we were dating. We, I, th I can't remember what movie we saw, but I took her to the movies, and we got our tickets, and we went to the concession stand. And Jacqueline wasn't ready. Jacqueline likes to look at a menu for a little while to make that perfect choice. And so I went and got my go-to, which is a Dr. Pepper and a Nestle Bunch of Crunch. And Jacqueline says, you know what? I'm not really that thirsty. I'll just have a few sips of your Dr. Pepper. Now, I didn't think... 
too much about this at first. I thought maybe she's being nice. She doesn't want me to spend too much money on her. And so I just said, oh, Jack, get what you want. Get what you want. I've got you. And she said, no, really, I just want a few sips of yours. Hmm. Now, we were young in our relationship, and so I was trying to, I was trying to come up with a nice way to say, uh, I'm ordering a Dr. Pepper because I want to drink all of it. <laughs> if you want a few sips of something, I'll get you a whole drink, and I'll finish off what you don't, okay? It's, it's, really, it's okay. <laughs> I don't know if y'all can relate to that uh, discussion, but uh, lucky for me, Lucky for me, uh, Jacqueline and I have things far greater in common than my inability to share a Dr. Pepper. This discussion still carries on today. We still haven't figured it out yet. But what we have in common is far greater than my inability to share a soda at the movie theater. Thank goodness. Kim Gill remembers well when I first came to the church uh, and I was new, it was back in 2012, Brother Brian took all of the staff out to eat, and at that time we had three secretaries in the office, and I believe we ate at uh, Timbers on the Green. Uh, I think that's what it's called, out at the country club. And I had never been there, I'm still getting to know my coworkers, still getting to know uh, Woody, and, and uh, I believe Joy was here at the time, and um, just, just, just getting to know everybody, and uh, I saw that on the menu there was a, a po' boy, and I thought, oh, okay, I'll get that. Well, one of the secretaries mentioned, the po' boy's huge. You're not going to be able to finish it all. Why don't, I, I like the po' boy too, why don't we uh, order it and split it? Mmm. I, I was brand new and uh, didn't want to blow my cover right away, okay, uh, in the relationships I had in the church. And so, uh, I was trying to think of a nice way to say, I'd like to eat all of the po' boy. Look at me, I can handle it. <laughs> okay? Uh, but luckily, I didn't have to say anything. If you, if, you, if you talk to Kim Gill about it, supposedly I had this horrified look on my face. I didn't hide it at all, and so I didn't have to say anything. The subject was dropped immediately. And I ate the entire po' boy. It was okay. Lucky for me, what me and my coworkers have in common is far greater than my inability to share a po' boy at lunch. And so the bond that we have can, uh, can exist and is successful. Here in the church, we're going to have differences, we're going to have quirks, we're going to have bumps in the road, but what we have in common is going to be far greater, is far greater than any disagreement that may rear its head in the future. When I read Paul's letter to the Philippians, there's this great joy and affection, and it makes me wonder, who are these people in the church in Philippi? Like, not, we know that they're the Philippian church, but who are they? What we want to do is we want to turn over to Acts 16, and we want to put a face to the name. Just who are these people that Paul has such affection for? They must have lots in common. They must have unique, I'm sorry, they must have very common backgrounds in order to, to have such a successful church. We want to go over to Acts 16, and there's three conversion stories that take place. And what I want to do is profile each one. See what these people have in common. So we begin that in Acts chapter 16. Starting in verse 11. As we come up uh, on this point in the story, this is Paul's second missionary journey. If you back up just a little bit to the very end of chapter 15 when he's getting ready to leave, him and Barnabas have a really sharp disagreement over whether or not to take John Mark with them. You see, John Mark left them at the very beginning of Paul's first missionary journey, and Paul didn't trust him to go with him. Barnabas, who was encouraging in nature and in spirit, he wanted to give John Mark a second chance, and they had such a sharp disagreement about this that Paul took Silas, and they went this way, and uh, Barnabas, he took John Mark, and they went this way, and they just decided to agree to disagree. 
Paul began his missionary journey with Silas, and he had a dream of a man from Macedonia saying, come and help us, come and save us. He woke up out of this vision, out of this dream, and he had determined, he determined that God was calling him to preach the gospel in the region of Macedonia. The very first city that he comes to in this region of Macedonia is Philippi, and so that's where we're going to pick up. Starting in verse 11, we meet a woman named Lydia. So let's read verses 11 through 15 and see what's going on with Lydia. So it says, Setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace in the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And so on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira. She was a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and after she was baptized, her and her household, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. What can we know about Lydia from this passage? What can we gain from this passage? First off, she's extremely wealthy. How do we know she's extremely wealthy? Well, she's from Thyatira, which is in the province of Asia, which just right before the, the Holy Spirit forbid Paul to go into that region and instead led him to Macedonia. So she's got a house in Thyatira. She's got a place. She's got her own house, which we know from the end of this passage in Philippi. She's a homeowner in two different places. We've got the house in Los Angeles. We've got the house in New York. She's in the fashion industry selling purple goods. She's got a lot of money. We also know, which is very important, that she's seeking out the one true God. She's a God-fearer, which means she rejected polytheism before her encounter with Paul. She's not trying to go after many gods, but she's trying to seek out the one true God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. She's learning the ways of the Jews, and she's wanting to know who the one true God is. So she's familiar with the law. She just doesn't have a complete picture yet. We also know she's seeking God because she's together with a group of women. They're having their Bethmore Bible study right now. They're together, and, and, and they're talking about the scriptures. Paul comes in, and he presses pause on the tape, and he says, let me, let me fill in the blanks for you. Watch how God goes after her. Knowing her backgrounds, in Judaism, how she's seeking after the one true God, Paul comes into this group of ladies, and he begins to fill in the blanks. Here's where you fall short, and here's what Christ did. Christ accomplished something that we could never do. And through intellect, and through reasoning, and through discussion, she comes to know Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. She was baptized, her and her entire household, and then she invites Paul to come and operate out of her house. Come stay with me. For the tent maker, this probably isn't a bad deal. So we've got Lydia. Let's look at the slave girl. Look at verse 16. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Now, I, I had a hard time with this verse, because it doesn't look like Paul does this out of love. He's just greatly annoyed. Okay, my, my Bible says greatly annoyed. But it says greatly annoyed. He turned and said to the Spirit, that had this little girl. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. 
What do we know about this slave girl? First off, she wasn't of great importance. The scriptures don't even name her. A lot of times when you were a slave, you weren't even given a name. You didn't have your own identity. So she, opposite of Lydia, this girl had no real worldly importance. She wasn't wealthy. The Bible uses this term, the translation uses this term, spirit of divination. But I found it interesting that the Greek word divination is actually translated to python. She had a spirit of Python. If you're familiar with any kind of uh, Greek mythology, the sun god Apollo actually had a battle with Python and killed him. And at the temple of Delphi, which is where all the Greeks went to go get their fortunes read, there was a great statue commemorating this event. And so it's interesting that this girl had a spirit of python inside of her. Where Lydia was dignified and educated and intellectual, this little girl was out of control. This little girl had no education. This little girl had no identity. She was completely opposite of what we see with Lydia. But watch how God goes after her. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out that very hour. It, it, and here's how this looks, where God engaged Lydia with intellect and discussion and reasoning. God saved this girl with a demonstration of Holy Spirit power. Because, see, this girl wasn't seeking after the one true God like Lydia was. This girl had no idea that she needed to be rescued. This thing inside of her gave her whatever identity she had, gave her her understanding and worldview, gave her the hope that she had, whatever little hope that might have been. And in an instant, when Paul commanded this spirit to come out of her, in this instant of Holy Spirit power, this girl had a new understanding. This girl had a new way of thinking. She had a freedom she never knew. She had a new hope. Where she was saying, this is a way, she could now say, this is the way. And God went after this girl. Just stopping for a second, aren't you thankful? I know, personally, I'm thankful that God goes after those who don't even know they need him. So we've got Lydia. We've got this slave girl. Is there anything in common? Can you see these two hanging out and grabbing coffee sometime? It's different. Let's go on to the next one. See, something happens. God kind of sets Paul up for the next conversion because after the slave girl is freed, it says in verse 19, her owner saw that their hope of gain was gone. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. Verse 22, it says, The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, when you think of stocks, what picture comes to mind? Kind of think of the Middle Ages, people have their hands and their head through the holes, and they're just sitting there, kind of bored, nothing to do. The Romans were far more cruel. See, when the Romans put people... Specifically, these guys put their feet in the stocks. What the Romans would do is they'd contort their body into very uncomfortable shapes and positions and fasten their hands and their feet. So these guys only had their feet. Fasten their limbs in the stocks in that position. So it would create great cramping and pain and agony. Now, I tell you guys this to give you a greater picture of what happens next. In verse 25, it says, About midnight, Paul and Silas are praying and singing hymns to God. 
and the prisoners are listening to them. They've got their feet in a weird, painful position in the stocks, and they're singing, and they're praying to God. Matt Chandler, the, the pastor of the Village Church in Dallas, he talks about this particular verse, saying how frustrating Paul must be to those who hate the gospel. How frustrating is Paul to those who want to punish him? Paul says to live is Christ, and they say, well, we're going to throw you in prison and torture you. That's fine. I don't compare the sufferings of this world to compare to the glory that is found in Christ Jesus. Well, then we're going to kill you. To die is gain. Well, fine, we're going we're gonna to throw you in prison. That's fine, I'll sing at midnight. <laughs> How frustrating is Paul? You can't, you can't shake him. I mean, he's just, he's finding joy in every situation, in every circumstance. He's got to be frustrating to those who are enemies of the gospel. And then enters our third conversion story. It says, suddenly, while he was praying, while he was singing, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately, all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, we're all here. And the jailer called for lights, rushed in, still trembling. With fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and all your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. He took them in the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. He was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. We've got Lydia, the wealthy dealer in purple goods who is seeking God. We've got the slave girl who was out of control had no identity, no hope in and of herself, wasn't seeking God. And now we've got this, this Roman jailer. What can we know about the Roman jailer? What can we know about this guy? How did God go after him? Well, the first thing to know about the jailer is that he was duty-bound. Most of these jailers are ex-GIs, they're ex Roman infantry, and so when they get a little older, a little less able, they've got prison duty. And we know this guy was duty-bound. We know he wanted to fulfill his responsibility to Rome by the very picture that when he thought the prisoners had escaped, he was ready to kill himself. He had his sword drawn because that was his duty to Rome. He had failed. Here's a guy that laid all of his hopes and dreams in what is Rome. The glory of Rome. And watch. Watch how God goes after him. When Paul and Silas were still in the prison, it shook the jailer to his core. The jailer wasn't saved through rational discussion or reason, like Lydia. He wasn't saved through a demonstration of Holy Spirit power like the slave girl. He was saved through an example of Christian living. Why didn't Paul and Silas take off and run? They had their body twisted into weird shapes and positions, cramping up and in pain. They didn't know what was going to happen the next day. Why did they stay? It was through a demonstration, an example of Christian living that shook the jailer to his core. And he came in trembling in, what did he say? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Because this is not behavior you're going to see anywhere else. There's no prisoner that's going to stick around and say, well, make sure the jailer's okay. No, they're going to run so that he'll kill himself and hopefully make an escape before they're found. Does the jailer have anything in common with Lydia? Does the jailer have anything in common with the slave girl? Can you imagine starting a church? Here's a new church. And we've got Lydia, we've got the slave girl, and we've got the jailer. 
We can throw in that the jailer was probably blue collar. <laughs> the description of the jailer. We've got these three people who have absolutely nothing in common except that they had a saving experience with Jesus Christ. They've got Christ in common. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, and I hope that you are, it's natural, it's worldly, it's kind of our inclination to do life with people who look like us, act like us, and think like us. We go to church with people who are like us. We want to live in neighborhoods with people who are like us. We want our kids to go to school with people who are like them. We are friends with people and share close connections with those who share the same political ideals and beliefs and celebrate life's greatest moments with people who are like us. And look at how the gospel breaks down every man-made construct. Every wall that we might put up, how the gospel crashes it and brings people together. Brother Donnie is preaching a series of passages on the church. We are becoming I truly believe this. We are in the process of becoming the church that God wants us to be. This has been an exciting few months, has it not? This has been an awesome time. How amazing will it be that as God continues to grow us and mature us and transform us, that we begin to do life with the gospel in common. We begin to do life with people with the gospel in common and stop seeing socioeconomic status. Stop. I wasn't going to mention, I'm not picking at any particular church, okay? But it's amazing today. You can go to any big city, even around here. We've got churches for cowboys. We've got churches for country people. We've got churches for people with particular music preferences. Whole churches built around the type of songs that are sung in the worship service. We've got churches with the sign for whosoever. We've got churches for, we've got a church in this area for people who like hard rock. Gather around your love for rock music. We've got Sunday school classes that are built around, I'm not saying in this particular church, but Sunday school groups, whole Sunday school groups are built around the idea that they like to do fantasy football or built around this or that. I believe we're in the process of becoming a church that is centered around Jesus Christ. God has sent us a man to come and preach the word. And through these last few weeks as he's been preaching on the church, God is shaping us and he's molding us to center around Christ. That regardless of what differences we have, Regardless of what differences we have, we have Christ in common, and that is far greater. Lucky for us, that is far greater than any difference or any quirk that we might have. Any disagreement, we have Christ in common. So I look forward to the day, and I know y'all look forward to the day when we can all say, like Paul, and we have a complete picture here in this very sanctuary, when Paul says in Galatians 3.28, There is no Jew or Gentile. There is no slave or free. There is no male or female. But we are all one in Christ Jesus. We have a common bond that allows us to do life together, to take care of each other, to love one another, to do all these things that Brother Donnie has been challenging us to do. A common bond that is far greater than any human construct and will smash through those walls. Let us pursue and seek after that. Church, as we come to a time of closing, I want to remind you that the altars are open to pray. 
anything that is on your heart, anything that is on your mind. As Brother Donnie will tell you, you can stay right there in your pew, and God will hear you just from, from there. But the altars are open if you need to pray. If you've been sitting here this morning and, and, and you hear the challenge that we've been given as a church, that if a, if a jailer, if a slave girl, and if Lydia can come together and, and do a church plant and flourish, and that's the kind of church we want to become. If you want to become a part of that, I want to encourage you to come down and we'll talk about what it means to be a member of First Baptist Church. Isn't it amazing? I mean, Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians, uh, I believe it was 10 years after the events of Acts chapter 16, when he said, I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. He's talking about Lydia. He's talking about the slave girl. Is the slave girl a young woman now? Is she married? Does she have kids of her own? Does she have her own family? He's talking about the Philippian jailer. Is the jailer still rough around the edges? Can they now laugh? Hey, remember that time you put me in stocks? <laughs> He's thinking fondly of these people. I so love this body of Christ that God has given us. And I hope that we can say the same for each other, that we think of each other fondly. We long for each other's company because we've got Christ in common. Last but not least, we talked about if you want to come join and be a member. If you were thinking about Lydia and the slave girl, and the jailer, and you thought to yourself, you know, I've never had a conversion experience. I've never given my heart and my life to Christ Jesus. I ask that you come down. Let's pray together. Let's talk about what that means. Because just like God went after the jailer, just like God went after the slave girl, just like God went after Lydia, he's coming after you. Do not deny him. Do not reject him. God wants your heart. Lord Jesus, we come to this time of decision. We come to this time of reflection. And I just pray, Lord, that you will stir our hearts. We are so excited for how you are working and how you are moving here in Jasper, Texas, here at First Baptist Church. And Lord, we look forward to the future when we can all join hands regardless of our differences, regardless of the quirks and the bumps in the road that come up. <laughs> and celebrate because we have you in common. Something far greater than any disagreement we may ever have as the church. Jesus, move us to action. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand and let's sing. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to blood can cleanse each spot, O oh Lamb of God, I come, I come, I come broken to be mended, I come Come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcomed with open arms. Praise God, just as I.
there it is. Tapped it at the wrong time. Guys, I want to thank y'all so much for being here, and thank you, uh, as always, for giving me the opportunity to, to bring the word when our main pastor's away. Guys, I want to invite you to come back uh, tonight at 5 p.m. Come be part of the life of the church, not just Sunday mornings, but come be part of what's going on throughout the week. 5 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Students, we're going to be in the gym tonight. Tatums are hosting from 5 to 7 p.m. Wednesday night at 6 p.m. We've got service here. Brother Donnie will be back next Sunday. Okay? He's off enjoying time with his grandkids and his son and daughter-in-law. In, uh, in Nashville, and so he'll be back and he'll be joining us next Sunday morning. Uh, we've got deacons meeting today at 4, and so if you're a deacon, I want to encourage you to come and join us in the His Followers classroom at 4 p.m. And not, uh, last but not least, I want to encourage you, if, if you have been um, hearing me ask for nursery volunteers in December, and have thought to yourself, well, well, let me wait and see if anyone else signs up, we still need just a few more people, and so if you can just sign up for one Sunday, if you can just put your name down for one Sunday in December, we'll make sure that we've got adequate volunteers so that all of our kids can be covered for the month of December. Thank you so much. Let's stand once again and we'll sing. There is strength in the name of the Lord. There is power in the name of the Lord. There is hope in the name of the Lord, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord.